there, everyone. I have been away, but now I am back. And without any further ado, let's just get going on with our Data Feminism book club, because we've got some chapters to move through, and I'm, I'm ready to get going. I don't know about you, but I guess you must be, otherwise you wouldn't be here. All right, we're going to continue on with Chapter 3, What Gets Counted Counts. Chapter 3. Chapter 3, What Gets Counted Counts. Sign in or create an account to continue. These may be the most unwelcome words on the internet. For most who encounter them, these words elicit a groan and the inevitability of yet another password that will soon be forgotten. But for people like Maria Munir, the British college student who famously came out as gender non-binary to, then, President Barack Obama on live TV, the prospect of creating a new user account is more than an annoyance. I wince as I'm forced to choose female over male every single time, because that's what my passport says, and, being non-binary is still not legally recognized in the UK, Munir explains. For the estimated 9 to 12 million gender non-binary people in the world, that is, people who are not either male or female, the seemingly simple request to select gender can be difficult to answer, if it can be answered at all. Yet when creating an online user account, not to mention applying for a passport, the choice between male or female, and only male or female, are almost always the only options. These options, or the lack thereof, have consequences, as Munir clearly states, if you refuse to register non-binary people like me with birth certificates, and exclude us in everything from creating bank accounts to signing up for mailing lists, you do not have the right to turn around and say that there are not enough of us to warrant change. That's a really important point, that, um, you know, if you only present people with certain metrics... And then you go back later and go, see, there's only two genders because everyone fills out. There's only two genders being filled out. Like, yeah, but you're constructing your results. You're not analyzing. You're not collecting data in an open fashion and then clustering people based on their response categories. You're basically creating your outcomes by defining what options people have. And I think that sort of way of constructing social reality is not often reflected upon with people. When they go, oh, yeah, well, you know, non-binary people only make up like, you know, 1% or, you know, of the population. Like, well, do you really know that? Because if people aren't given an option, I mean, if you've asked me, if you give me a, a form that said woman or man, and that was my only choice on a form, I'd put woman. But if you asked me, like, do you feel like a woman? I would honestly say I don't even know what that means. I mean, I have the physiology, but does that, I don't feel distinct womanness because I have the shape of a woman. I acknowledge it in our society. This is what a lot of people consider like, you know, a feminine form and whatnot, body types. But my body type isn't what I am in myself. It isn't what I am in my head. Um, and so this idea that uh, what is a woman is somehow a simple answer, it's really not. And these kinds of simplistic data collection methods do present a false image of what people really think about themselves because it doesn't give them the option for flexibility. What gets counted counts, as feminist geographer Joni Seeger has asserted, and Munir is one person who understands that. Without the right categories, the right data can't be collected. And increasingly, without the right data, there can be no social change. We live in a world in which data-driven decisions are prioritized over anecdotal ones, and evidence, Fox News notwithstanding, is taken to mean backed up by numbers and facts. Now, any self-respecting feminist would be the first to tell you that personal accounts should matter. 49, 50 Chapter 3 We're going to skip that part. As much as any meta-study and evidence can take a range of qualitative and quantitative forms, to disagree with those statements would undo the work of the many feminist activists and scholars of the 1980s and early 1990s who struggled to get qualitative methods, such as interviews and participant observations, accepted as legitimate evidence in the first place. If I can just expand on that a little bit, because I wrote a piece for um, like an encyclopedia entry about gender and feminism and stuff, and it's under review at the moment. But one of the things that I pointed out there was that for a long time, social science was filled with men. I mean, basically, you know, going all the way back to Durkheim, the first kind of sociologist in our history of sociology courses. Um, there are some other people who did it, but Durkheim kind of did the landmark study on suicide, where he looks at demographics as a way of understanding factors that can influence suicide. Anyway, 
Um, so you had this field dominated entirely by men who were defining what was of value. And in second wave feminism, um, this time after femini first wave feminism, there was a critical mass of women in the social sciences. And in the 1960s, a woman went to her doctoral thesis advisor and said, OK, I've decided on my topic. I want to do my research on the sociology of housework. Because, of course, in the 1960s, women did not have uh, employment opportunities like they do today. In fact, it was quite a normal and expected social pressure for you to quit your job once you got married or definitely while you had kids. Because your job then was this unpaid, self-sacrificing labor that never ended, which was housework and child rearing, for which you got no in you know, distinct income, uh, for which you received a lower social security benefit at the end of your life. And uh, her doctoral researcher, her, who, or her advisor, who's a man, who said, home housework isn't a topic for sociology. Yet, you think about how many years of women's lives, historically, have been consumed by housework. And so this idea of what is and isn't valid is not an objective measure. It's not an objective standard. In fact, it's oftentimes, it's socially constructed as much as we are. And when you don't know about something or it's not something you spend your time on, you might not value it. So this whole idea that people's personal experiences <laughs> are valid areas of study and qualitative, understanding people's like experiences of things, their emotional experience, the uh, intellectual drawing on it, you know, the energy it takes, all this kind of stuff, the positive and the negatives that go with it, is where you can't do that in surveys. You have to do that qualitatively. And so being open to collecting data about people's lived experiences is the grounding of sociology. Okay, just getting on with things. But there is, undeniably, what feminist demographers Christina Hughes and Rachel Lara Cohen call a pragmatic politics of using quantitative methods for feminist aims. If the goal is to work towards justice, then by all means use whatever form of evidence is most convincing. It would be an injustice not to. That being said, there is a second argument in favor of quantitative methods that has less to do with pragmatism and more to do with the nature of the problem at hand. So many issues of structural inequality are problems of scale and can seem anecdotal until they are seen as a whole. For instance, when Natalie Rayford and Shelley Cobb set out to count the women involved in the film industry in the UK, they encountered a female screenwriter who had never considered the fact that, in the UK, male screenwriters outnumber women at a rate of four to one. Isn't that a funny old thing, she said. I didn't even know that because screenwriters never get to meet each other. But it's far less funny when the subject is a matter of life or death, as in ProPublica's reporting on the racial divide in maternal mortality in the United States, True. which we discuss in Bring Back the Bodies. While they interviewed the families of many black women who had died while giving birth, few were aware that the phenomenon extended beyond their own family. But the racial disparity in maternal health outcomes is indeed a structural problem, and it's why feminist sociologists like Anne Oakley have long advocated for the use of quantitative methods alongside qualitative ones. Without big data, Oakley explains although she just used the term quantitative research, since she was writing in 1999, it is difficult to distinguish between personal experience and collective oppression. That's why I'm a big fan of mixed methods, because I think it's important to get anecdotal personal experiences, because when we think about history or we think about society, we tend to relate to other people. We don't relate to structures, you know, like um, whether it's an underlying sexist structure or racist one, right? That is a aggregation of a lot of individual behaviors that all have a bias in them that lead to a consistent bias for entire groups, right? For instance, um, uh, black women's ma maternal health mortality rates. If it, you know, if it wasn't a systemic problem, we wouldn't see a disparity that is not only consistent like across the country, but across, uh, across incomes and across time. There's some gap there that isn't explained by region, by the type of treatment, right? Or, or, or like, or you know, like the. Uh, the qualifications of the doctor or the kind of the hospital that's there, but, um, uh, or the income of the person, whatever else, right? Serena Williams, I think they talk about later on, basically almost died and had to really fight for her health care and demand the doctors take her seriously. So, um, 
we only really illustrate those structural gaps or those structural problems through individuals. And that's why it is important that we look at lived experiences and we take them seriously. And I get that there's a lot of anti, the sort of STEM white dude researcher, like, oh, like there's no val validity there. And yet when you look at societies, the societies are made up of individuals. Um, so how can you, how else are you going to get data, right? How else are you going to understand phenomenon if you don't ask people? You can't sit and just pontificate from your limited perspective with your very narrow experience and think that you can speak for everybody. You got to open up, you got to turn on your listening ears and you got to hear what other people have to say and take them seriously. And for some people who aren't used to doing that, that's, that's, a, that's a hard reach. But before issues like the racial divide in maternal mortality or the structural racism that underlies it, can be identified through large-scale analyses like the one that ProPublica conducted, the data must exist in the first place. Which brings us back to Maria Munir and the importance of collecting data that reflects the population it claims to represent. On this issue, Facebook of all corporations was ahead of the curve when, in 2014, it expanded its gender options from the standard two to over 50 choices ranging from gender queer to neither a move that was widely praised by a range of gender non-binary groups. One year later, when the company abandoned its select from options model altogether, replacing the gender drop-down menu with a blank text field, the decision was touted as even more progressive. Because Facebook users could input any word or phrase in order to indicate their gender, they were at last unconstrained by the assumptions imposed by any preset choice. But research by Rena Bivens, a scholar of social media, has revealed that, below the surface, Facebook continues to resolve users' genders into one of either male. Pause and scroll. Ooh, scroll past the... Oh yes, it's just the illustrations of the drop-down boxes versus the open text boxes. Or female. Evidently, this decision was made so that Facebook could allow its primary clients' advertisers to more easily market to one gender or the other. Put another way, even if you can choose the gender that you show to your Facebook friends, you can't change the gender that Facebook's advertisers ultimately see. The problem there is that they're prepackaging the data for the um, advertisers. I think there's some really good work that could be done by aggregating up individual phrases. And you can do that pretty easily these days in terms of text analysis and clustering different responses for the gender categories. And honestly, you'd think that advertisers would want that kind of data because it exists. And it might have, you know, they, it might give them more information about how to manipulate people, which is what advertisers want to do. So, um, you know, reducing it down to a binary when you've got all of this variegation in your data and potentially interesting subcategories is, you know, it's kind of just basically taking value out of the data. And this discrepancy leads right back to the body issues we discussed in Chapter 1. It's corporations like Facebook and not individuals like Maria Munir who control the terms of data collection even if it's folks like Munir, who have personally, and often painfully, run up against the limits of our current classification systems, who are best positioned to improve them. Okay, scroll down. Past the artwork. Okay. Feminists have also spent a lot of time thinking about classification systems, as it turns out, since the criteria by which people are divided into the categories of male and female is exactly that, a classification system. And while the gender binary is one of the most universal classification systems in the world today, it is no less constructed than the Facebook advertising platform or, say, the Golden Gate Bridge. The Golden Gate Bridge is a physical structure, Facebook ads is a virtual structure, and the gender binary is a conceptual one. But each of these structures was created by people, people living in a particular place, at a particular time, and who were influenced as we all are by the world around them. I feel like this has a really uh, good intention, but it's one paragraph. Um, there's a lot to unpack here in terms of trying to link the physical construction of structures to the construction of social structures to the construction of conceptual structures. Like you could do an entire, I think, lecture in philosophy of language on this one line and, you know, really get into some interesting discussions. I don't think this book has the space for that, if I remember correctly. I did read this chapter already a couple of months ago, but um, let's keep going. Just going to point out that that's, a, that's actually some, like some deep stuff going on in that line. 
So just kind of let that sit and think about the parallels, perhaps. But uh, maybe hit pause, think deeply about the way things are constructed and what they have in common. And making made up of pieces, they require people, uh, they might have to change over time and adapt, you know, all kinds of cool stuff. So this starts to get at the meaning behind the phrase, gender is a social construct. Our current ideas about the gender binary can be traced to a place, Europe, and a time, the Enlightenment, when new theories about democracy and what philosophers called natural rights began to emerge. Before then, there was definitely a gender hierarchy, with men on the top and women on the bottom. Thanks, Aristotle. But there wasn't a binary. It wasn't just Aristotle. Like That was just societies based on violence. Um, and the physical difference gave males a physiological difference. And they were willing to use violence against females in order to force them and oppress them and repress them. So, yeah. I mean, I get it, the little wink and a nod there, but it wasn't just the Greeks. Very distinction between those two genders. In fact, according to the historian of gender, Thomas Lacour, most people believed that women were just inferior men, with penises located inside instead of outside of their bodies, and that four reals could descend at any time in life. That is an, I would like to, like, uh, a little bit more information on that. Uh, most people, I don't know what that means in terms of ancient history. And, um, uh, yes, like, uh, interesting concept that the penis could descend outside of the body. But again, that just seems like I would like to read more about that before I just accept that that's what most people believed, because I generally am quite skeptical of claims to say most people unless there's polling data behind it. For the gender binary to emerge, it would take figures like Thomas Jefferson declaring that all men were created equal and entire countries like the U.S. founded on that principle before those same figures began to worry what, exactly, they had declared, and, even more worrisome, to whom it actually applied. I'm going to disagree here, because this gender binary, I don't, I mean, they were tracing it back here in a more formal way to Europe and the Enlightenment, but we can see gendered clothing rules in the Hebrew scriptures. Like, there are rules there about men not wearing their hair long, and women wearing their hair long, and, like, covering your hair. And wearing, you know, dresses. Joan of Arc was basically one of the con things that she was convicted on was for wearing men's clothing, right? So I'm just going to say, I don't, I don't um, uh, press X to doubt here. I would disagree that the gender binary is something that is a product of Europe. I would actually say that it was a product of monotheism, the kinds of monotheism we have, tracing back to um, the Hebrew scriptures that dominated European culture and also... Uh, Jewish culture and um, Muslim culture. So we all have a common problematic start, which is uh, the patriarchy of the Bible. All sorts of systems for classifying people date to that era, not only gender, but also, crucially, race. Before the 18th century, Western societies understood race as a concept tied to religious affiliation, this I do agree with. geographic origin, or some combination of both. Although it's hard to believe, race had nothing to do with skin color until the rise of the transatlantic slave trade in the 17th century. Even then, race was still a hazy concept. It would take the so-called scientific racism of the mid-18th century for race to begin to be defined in terms of black and white. Ever heard of Carl Linnaeus? Think back to middle school, when you likely learned about the binomial classification system that- I don't even know what a binomial classification system is now. So I don't remember learning about it in middle school. Um, just didn't throw that out there. Maybe that's a deficiency with my public education back in the day. But uh, um, again, I understand where they're going here with the, uh, the sort of the scientification, I'm going to say, the fact that um, in the 18th century, classifications and scientific method and evidence-based and all that kind of stuff started to become more formalized. But again, I don't think when it comes to the gender issue, and, and I do agree more with the race issue, but I, I tend to be more skeptical uh, because of the contrary evidence that I know of on the, on the issue of gender binaries, the false gender binary, I should say. That he is credited with creating. 
Well, Linnaeus's revolutionary system didn't just include the category of Homo sapiens, it also, lamentably but as historians would tell you, unsurprisingly included okay, five so scientific races of humans separated by race. Okay. One of these five was set aside for mythological humans who didn't exist in real life, in case you're still <laughs> ready to get behind his science. But Linnaeus's classification system wasn't even the worst of the lot. Over the course of the 18th century, increasingly racist systems of classification True. began to emerge. These were systems that were designed to exclude, and in instances as far-ranging as the maternal health outcomes we've already discussed, to Google search results for black girls versus white girls, as information study scholar Safiya Noble has shown, we can detect the scroll, 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 effects of those racist systems every day. A simple solution would be to say, fine, then, let's just not classify anything, or certainly anyone. But the flaw in that plan is that data must also be classified in some way in order to be put to use. Data, after all, is information made tractable, to borrow a term from computer science, and from another essay that Lauren wrote with a colleague in information studies, Miriam Posner. What distinguishes data from other forms of information is that it can be processed by a computer or by computer-like operations, we write there. And in order to enable those operations, which range from counting to sorting, and from modeling to visualizing, the data must be placed into some kind of category if not always into a conceptual category like gender, then at the least into a computational category like integer, a type of number, or string, a sequence of letters or words. It's been argued that classification systems are essential to any working infrastructure and not only to computational infrastructures or even conceptual ones, but also to physical infrastructures like the checkout line at the grocery store. Think about how angry you get when you're stuck in the express line behind someone with more than 15 items. Or, if that's not something that gets you going, just think of the system you use to sort your clothes for the wash. It's not that we should reject these classification systems out of hand, or even that we could if we wanted to. We're pretty sure that no one wants all of their socks to turn pink. It's just that we rarely question how classification systems are constructed, or ask why they might have been thought up in the first place. In fact, and this is a point also made by the influential information theorists Jeffrey Boker and Susan Lee Starr, we tend not to even think to ask these questions until our systems break. Classification systems can break for any number of reasons. They can break when an object or, more profoundly, a person can't be placed in the appropriate category. They can break when that object or person doesn't want to be placed in an appropriate category. And they can break when that object or person shouldn't even be placed in a category to begin with. In each of these cases, it's important to ask whether it's the categories that are broken, or whether, and this is a key feminist move, it's the system of classification itself. This, I feel like this chapter is all over the place and it's kind of a general complaint I have with this book. Like, it just seems to wander from topic to topic and I don't know why I'm learning about things in the order that I am, but that's a more meta critique. On this, this particular point, though, I would say that um, when you ask people about the gender binary and then you point out, well, what about intersex people? They go, well, yeah, but there's some of them, but, you know, there's not enough of them to count. Like, if any exist, it means that two categories isn't enough, but they're so attached to this false lie that there's only two genders, that they're willing to basically accept and deny the existence of other people. They accept that they exist, but they won't accept that their system is broken. Like, if, if intersex people exist, then there can't be a gender binary, because yeah, you know, like, oh, well, you know, like, that doesn't mean there's another gender. I'm like, well, they don't fit into the two categories that exist. And if you force them into them, then you're basically, like, breaking the rules of what it you know, means to be a woman, means to be a man, right? Because then you're expanding it beyond this narrow definition. So either you have to say, uh, these people don't exist and lie to yourself, or you have to admit your false gender binary is a false gender binary, and you need to rethink the concept of gender. Um... I, I just kind of wish in this book that they were, I wish I knew where they were going. I always feel like I st it's just story after story after story, and I never understand the roadmap of where a chapter is going or what I'm meant to take away. So I'm kind of mixing both support for this book with critique of this book, which is what I tend to do with this book, because I both love it and hate it, <laughs> so, for what it's worth. Whether it's the gender binary, or the patriarchy, or, to get a little heady, the distinction between nature and culture, or reason and emotion, or public and private, 
or body and world, decades of feminist thinking would tell us to question why these distinctions might have come about, what social, cultural, or political values they reflect, and, crucially, whether they should exist in the first place. But let's spend some time without an actual person who has done this kind of thinking, one Michael Hicks, an eight-year-old Cub Scout from New Jersey. Why has this kid started to question the broken systems of classification that surround him? Well, Mikey, as he's more commonly known, shares his first and last name with someone who has been placed on a terrorist watch list by the U.S. federal government. As a result, Mikey is subjected to the highest level of airport. Pause and scroll. Security screening each time that he travels. A terrorist can blow his underwear up and they don't catch him. But my eight-year-old can't walk through security without being frisked, his mother lamented to Lizette Alvarez, a reporter for the New York Times, who covered the issue in 2010. Of course in some ways, Mikey is lucky. His is white, so he does not run the risk of racial profiling. He Any is number white, of black obviously. women can tell you how many times they've received a pat-down only because of their hair. Moreover, Mikey's name is not Muslim-sounding, so he does not need to worry about religious or ethnic profiling either. Anyone in the U.S. named Muhammad can tell you how many times they've been pulled over by the police. But Mikey the Cub Scout still helps to expose the brokenness of the categories that structure the TSA's terrorist classification system. The combination of first and last name is simply insufficient to classify someone as a terrorist or not. Or, consider another person with a history of bad experiences at the, literal, hands of the TSA, Sasha Costanza Chalk. Costanza Chalk is, like Maria Munir, gender, non-binary. They are also a design professor at MIT, so they have a lot of experience not only living with, but also thinking through broken classification systems. In a recent essay, they describe how the seemingly simple system employed by the operators of those hand-in-the-air millimeter wave scanning machines is in fact quite complex and also fundamentally flawed. No one but a gender non-conforming person would know that, before you step into a scanning machine, the TSA agent operating the machine looks you up and down, decides whether you are male or female, and then pushes a button to select the appropriate gender on the scanner's touchscreen interface. That decision loads the algorithmic profile for either male bodies or female ones, against which your measurements are compared. If your body's measurements diverge from the statistical norm of that gender's body, whether the discrepancy is because you're concealing a deadly weapon, or because the TSA agent just made the wrong choice, you trigger a risk alert, and are subjected to the same full-body pat-down as a potential terrorist. So here it's not that the scanning machines rely upon an insufficient number of categories, as in the case of Mikey the Cub Scout, or even that they employ the wrong ones, as Mikey's mom would likely say. It's that the TSA scanners shouldn't rely on the category of gender to classify air travelers to begin with. So when we say that what gets counted counts, it's folks like Costanza Chalk, or Mikey, or Maria Munir, that we're thinking about. Because broken classification systems like the one that underlies the airport scanner's risk detection algorithm, or the one that determines which names end up on terrorist watch lists, or simply, simply, the gender binary, are often the result of larger systems that are themselves broken, but that most people don't often have the opportunity to see. These invisible systems are what philosopher Michel Foucault would call systems of power. Systems of power don't simply determine the categories into which individual objects or people are sorted. They overdetermine how those groups of objects or people experience the world. That's a really important point. I remember I was talking about Foucault and systems of power in my once like introduction to research methods. And I talked to this other quant professor and he was like horrified that I would even mention Foucault. But like Foucault had some good, like, made some good analyses. Systems of power is one of them. And um, over determining how people uh, experience the world is something that's a serious problem because it leads to error in our measurements or error in our analysis. We're again creating the results, not measuring them. And that problem is something we always have to be aware of as social scientists and being skeptical of our own data and skeptical of our own measurements and tentative in our claims is the morally responsible thing to do. So, you know, not everything has to be about positivism. <laughs> And, and this sort of external world that exists separate from mind, understanding that most of what we measure is constructed by human beings and those human beings have limitations and biases that they bring and that those measures are incomplete doesn't mean that they're useless, but we can't take them as truth. Facts are not truth. 
And the way I distinguish between a fact and a truth is that a truth doesn't change, and facts can. Facts can, with new measurements, better measurements, new information, change. Or because of the way humans construct their realities. Is Pluto a planet? Well, it depends on when you asked. Before it existed, no. After people found it and thought it was a planet, yes. After they changed it from being a planet to being a, like a dwarf, whatever it is, now, um, no. Did Pluto ever change? Did the, did the existence of that rock, that distance from the sun ever change? No. That exists as a truth, right, in, in, in external reality. But our perceptions of its classification, which is purely constructed by our linguistics and the way that we conceptualize the world, is a fact that we construct. But that fact changes when the definitions change or when the information changes or maybe when the measurements change. So facts change truth doesn't. Two plus two equals four will always be true. Two plus two equals four is a tautology. It's true by definition, right? And that's not going to change based on, um, but facts can. What does it mean for a system to overdetermine how people experience the world? Many feminists would point to the example of the patriarchy, a word that describes the combination of legal frameworks, social structures, and cultural values that contribute to the continued male domination of society. But for a more concrete example, we could return to Facebook. I, it's I, not only that anyone who types in a gender... That I don't like that definition. Um, this is buying into the definition of patriarchy. This is buying into the old school. This is buying into the false gender binary notion of patriarchy. Um, continued male domination of society, sort of. Right, patriarchy is more than just men versus women, because again, that reinforces the binary. We're talking about an elite group of men, and we're talking about women who collaborate with them. Patriarchy isn't just about men running stuff. There are women who buy into patriarchy and enable that uh, submit that um, they're complicit in that oppression. Maybe because it's they think they're being pious. Maybe because it gives them status. Whatever else, but um, it is about male preferences and male domination, but within there, within patriarchy, what this definition leaves out is that, one, women collaborate, there are collaborators with patri women who collaborate with patriarchy, and two, there are men who are exploited. Patriarchy is used to police sexuality and gender and gender norms and everything to do with like the human, that part of, 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 of being a human being, right? It, it has a very narrow definition. It's heterosexual. Um, it, it, it relies on male violence. It's hierarchical. Right? There's all kinds of elements there. Um, and patriarchy is used to police other men. It's not only used to dominate women. It's used to uh, bully and terrorize and use violence against homosexual men, men who aren't seen as manly enough. And it forces all men to constantly perform masculinity to demonstrate they're a man. When they, you, you, there's never a go, okay, now I'm a man. I never have to prove this again. Right? It's a constant... Um, way of policing men, just like clothing and violence against women and the threat of sexual assault are ways that patriarchy tries to control women. And of course, it completely negates trans people um, and non-binary people by denying their existence. So it's such an inadequate definition of patriarchy. As you well know, this is my particular thing. Um, I think patriarchy needs to be really revised in light of um, what how um, basically trans um, rights have gone farther than radical feminists did in terms of questioning the gender binary and wanting to deconstruct gender. Uh, a lot of those second wave feminists who wanted to deconstruct gender, are, um, some of them now are very focused on biology and what your genitals look like and want to define people by that, which kind of goes against the whole idea of eliminating gender hierarchy from society at all. But that's another topic. Um, so I just had to go on that little rant because, as you know, that's that's my personal take these days on patriarchy. We need an update. Uh, we need patriarchy definition 2.0 to better, uh, because the model we work with now, this male domination, doesn't work. It's more, it's more widespread. Its oppression is more nefarious and subtle than what this is represented here that is not male or female is reduced, in the eyes of advertisers, to the single category of unknown. It's also that, at the level of code, these three remaining categories are further reduced to numerical values, one, two, and three, respectively. 
So when an app developer requests a list of users sorted by gender for any reason, whether it's to sell them useless diet pills, 50% off retail, which no one ever wants, or to offer them a free financial consultation, first come first served, which many people do, they receive a list in which male Facebook users are hard-coded to be always first in line. If that, uh, I mean, uh, all right, I have some, uh, uh, this this isn't like one two three. I mean, it, it, you don't know for sure that males are always coded one, females are always coded two, and uh, um, other or unknown or un whatever like don't knows whatever coded is three. That's kind of a guess. I've seen um, a deliberate attempts, you know, like people who code females one, but it's just a filter. It's not um, one two three in a list. You filter on these numbers, so. There's a little bit of a, like, yeah, yeah. This in terms of complaints, I don't know that this particular who gets offered crappy ads first is is the one that I would have picked for this um, to illustrate this point. Now, the software engineers who wrote the word to number code were almost certainly not intending to discriminate. They were probably only thinking, how can we make our gender data easier to sort and manage? And when it comes to computational data, it's almost always easier and more efficient to deal with numbers than it is to deal with words. But it's also not a surprise that in a group of engineers which is a reported 87% male, no one thought to point out, or maybe just that no one felt comfortable saying out loud, that a data classification system in which men are always ranked first might lead to problems for those who ranked second or third, not to mention those excluded from the list altogether. In fact, if you were to ask a feminist theorist like Judith Butler to weigh in, she'd tell you that the inadvertent and invisible way in which systems of power reproduce themselves is exactly how the gender binary consolidates its force. It's not- I don't disagree, I just don't think that's the best example. Not only Facebook, that's to blame. Gender data is almost always collected in the binary categories of male and female, and visually represented by some form of binary as well. This remains true even as a recent Stanford study found that, when given the choice among seven points on a gender spectrum, more than two-thirds of the subjects polled placed themselves somewhere in the middle. It's also important to remember that there have always been more variations in gender identity than Anglo-Western societies have cared to outwardly acknowledge. Now, this colonialist critique is really good and probably should have like come up way, way earlier in the chapter. It's getting buried near the end when I actually think this really could have been made much higher up in the chapter. Or collectively remember, these third, fourth, and NTH genders go by different names in the different historical and cultural circumstances in which they originate, including female husbands, indigenous berdaches, hijras, two spirits, pansy performers, and sworn virgins, along with the category of transgender that we most commonly use today. Now, as data analysts and visualization designers, we can't always control the collection process for the data we use in our research. Like the Facebook engineers, we're often working with data that we've obtained from someplace else. But even in those cases and, arguably, especially in those cases it's important to ask how and why the categories of the data set we're using were constructed, and what systems of power they might represent. I just feel like this chapter, this, or sorry, not chapter, this paragraph should have been like, up way higher. Like we're getting, we had to get through a lot to get here. And I feel like if they would have put this closer to the top and then elaborated on it, I guess I have a lot of problems with the way they structure information in this book. Because when it comes to pause, classification systems, there's power up and down, side to side, and everywhere in between. And it's on us, as data feminists, to ensure that any differentials of power that are encoded in our data sets don't continue to spread. That's actually like a really, again, this is an important point. Why aren't you saying this earlier? Why is this buried toward the end of the chapter after you've done a whole bunch of stuff? Like, this is a good framing chapter, uh, paragraph. It gives meaning and context to the rest of the information. I feel like this should have been, again, much higher up in the in the chapter because it would have been less of like, why am I going from this point to this point? Why am I talking about um, an eight-year-old boy who's on a terrorist, his name's on a terrorism list? And why am I mixing up black uh, women's maternal mortality with how um, gender is coded one, two, three on Facebook? Um, <sighs> yeah. All right. Whether we like it or not, we're all already swayed by these systems of power, as well as by the heuristic techniques that reinforce them. Before you say, wait. No one taught me those techniques. Consider that heuristic techniques is just a fancy term for the use of mental shortcuts to make judgments in other words, common sense. 
The tendency of people to adhere to common sense offers a great evolutionary advantage. In uh, again, why are you burying this at the end of the paragraph, at the end of the chapter? Oh, these kinds of concepts should be laid out at the start. And that it's enabled humanity to survive over many millennia. What tells you to run away from a bear? Common sense. What tells you not to eat rancid meat? Also common sense, and your gag reflex. But as the renowned work of cognitive psychologists Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky has showed. Also, why are you naming the authors here, but you didn't mention the authors in the Stanford study? Again, the, the, there's very hit and miss consistency in this chapter. This reliance on heuristics eventually leads to an accumulation of cognitive biases what might be otherwise understood as a snowball of mistaken assumptions that, in a world more challenged by structural inequalities than by grizzly bears, leads to profoundly flawed decision-making and equally profoundly flawed results. Buster Benson, a product manager at the crowdfunding platform Patreon, has made a hobby of classifying these cognitive biases, and with John Mnugin, has visualized them in the chart you see above. If you look at the lower half of the image, you see can see the two quadrants, need to act fast and not enough meaning that includes some of the key cognitive biases that come into play when collecting and classifying data. Now imagine, for a moment, that you are designing a new survey for an analysis of gender and cell phone usage, but you have not yet finished reading this book. Gender is something you are pretty familiar with, you might say to yourself, since you have a gender, and everyone else you know has a gender too. But this is called the overconfidence effect, found on the lower left of the chart in lime green. Still, you go on, in your experience there are two genders, male and female, and everyone else you know would say so, too. This is called the false consensus effect, also on the lower left. Men and women should clearly be placed in separate categories, since they are different kinds of people. This is called essentialism, file under not enough meaning. This is, you're, ugh, why, okay, there's so much, each of these could have their own, like, uh, entire paragraphs. Um, again, they're just kind of throwing all this stuff out here and expecting us to just accept it at face value without really explaining it. We spent so much time, like, on this, like, again, eight-year-old experience of TSA when they could have just gone with the security thing. And they could have actually set up some of these ideas much earlier on, again, to frame the rest of the anecdote. I, I get so frustrated with this book. Also, everyone knows that women like talking, stereotyping alert. So in addition to gender data, how about collecting cell phone minutes data too? You've just committed a fundamental attribution error in blue on the right. Without explaining what a fundamental attribution error is. Ah! Fast forward past the data collection phase to the analysis portion of the project. You note that you were right in your initial assessment of the situation. Women did talk on their cell phones more than men. This forms the basis of your subsequent analysis. This is called confirmation bias. Undefined. In addition, in your zeal to confirm your essentialist beliefs, you entirely missed an important phenomenon. Millennial-aged people of all genders have extremely large social networks. Your expectation bias prevented you from discovering some important insights that might have informed the design of a new product. You receive a negative. Oh, that's easy to read. <laughs> what the hell? It's this, uh, this, this could have been the entire chapter. You really could have like explained what a logical fallacy is and how that differs from a bias or how they're connected. And you could explain, like, define what various um, logical fallacies are or how bias. It, uh... My, this book, I swear. What interrupts this series of oops, bad, oops, bad performance, performance review, review and you are fired? That's what extreme. interrupts this series of bad decisions? Recognizing that common sense is often sexist, racist, and harmful for entire groups of people, especially those groups, like women, who find themselves at the bottom end of a hierarchical classification system, or like non-binary folks, who are excluded from the system altogether. Again, I think if you talk about the fact that common sense is often racist, sexist, and harmful for entire groups, and then you go through all the examples and show various stereotypes, right? then you're setting up the premise and demonstrating the results with appeal to, in this case, appeal to people's own common sense in the way. And, and 
as opposed to just like throwing a bunch of different uh, biases or logical fallacies in a big list and then concluding with this. I just think so many times the information is presented in a not very helpful order. As should now be clear, a feminist critique of classification systems is not limited to data about women or to the category of gender alone. This point can't be overstated, as it forms the basis for the theories of intersectional feminism that inspire this book. Again, this needs to go at the top to give context as to why we're talking about the experiences of Black maternal mortality and systemic racism. Why we're comparing the exists the the experience of a white boy who's presumably you know, who has a Christian name to people who are not white or people who are you know people of color and people of of Arab descent. <laughs> Feminist scholars Brittany Cooper and Margaret Ree address this issue directly in their call to use feminist thinking to hack the binary logic that simultaneously underlies the racism experienced by black people in the United States and erases the other forms of racism experienced by ladings, Asian American, and indigenous groups. Binary racial discourses elide our struggles for they justice, they state clearly, and we agree. By hacking the binary distinctions that erase the experiences of certain groups, as well as the systems of power that position those groups against each other, we can work towards a more just and equitable future. Even though the stakes of this project are high, it's possible for anyone, including you, our readers, to contribute. One of the best visualizations of the concept of intersectionality that we've found, for instance, comes from a series of posts on anonymously authored WordPress blog. Intersectionality, illustrated, offers a series of visualizations that employ color gradients to represent the multiple axes of privilege, or the lack thereof, that a person might encounter in the world. At the center of each visualization is a solid circle, which represents that person's goals and dreams for their life. Colorful lenses spiral out from the center, each representing an aspect of that person's identity, ethnicity, age, sexual orientation, and so on. In this visualization, opacity is employed to show whether a particular identity trait contributes to an enhanced capacity to achieve one's personal goals, or a diminished one. A directional gradient underscores how that trait alternately supports the person's goals, or distances them from them. In this way, the viewer begins to literally see how an intersection of privileged positions, a term used to describe the advantages offered only for oh, now we get, groups, now we get a definition. that come along with being awesome. white, male, able-bodied or college-educated can lead to an array of colorful options for the future. An intersection of disadvantaged positions, on the other hand, such as being gay, or transgender, or disabled, or poor, reduces, and, at times, eliminates altogether, that person's ability to pursue a particular life path. It's a simple visualization, which relies only upon the creative use of color, opacity, gradient, and form, and yet it illustrates a powerful point, that one's identity, and therefore one's privilege, is determined by multiple factors that all intersect. In addition to the intersection of the various aspects of a person's identity, each individual aspect can be quite complex. Again, an anonymous person on the internet offers among the most inspiring examples for considering how we pause and scroll. There we go. That's, that's the picture. Might visualize gender, for example, if we weren't limited to, to the male-slash-female split. The creator of the non-binary safe space Tumblr shows how gender might be visualized as a spectrum or as a branching tree. They sketch out how non-binary genders might be placed around a circle in order to emphasize shared sensibilities rather than differences or plotted on a Cartesian plane in which male and female serve as the axes with infinite points in between. They even wonder about designing a series of interactive sliders with female and not female, male and not male, and other and not other, serving as the respective poles, or even a 3D cube, with a vector charting a person's changing course through their evolving sense of self. These are designs that, like intersectionality, illustrated, come from personal experience, and they offer a powerful point of departure for thinking through new classification systems and visualization schemes. When we went to track down the permissions for the non-binary safe space Tumblr, we discovered that the site had been taken over by spammers. But maybe it's a sign of the times, along with the inevitable descent into spam, that some of these ideas have already begun to enter major publications. 
For example, when Amanda Montañez, a designer for Scientific American, was tasked with creating an infographic to accompany an article on the evolving science of sex and gender, she envisioned a spectrum not unlike the one pictured above. Can I just point out this um, f not female to more female, not male to more male is actually has existed in psychology since the 1970s. Personal attributes questionnaire and the BEM sex role inventory both operate on that. Not that you have male and female at two ends of a spectrum, but that you have female and less, like more female, less female, more male, less male. Uh, and more androgynous, less and 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 uh, different, whatever it is. But yeah, this isn't like twenty twenty uh, first century thinking. This is actually goes back to the late twentieth century. I'm just saying that this this idea has been around for like longer than I almost as long as I've been alive, and I'm old. But she soon found confirmation of what feminist theorists have been saying for decades, and what we've been saying so far in this book that sex and gender pause and scroll. Uh, uh, artwork artwork with way too tiny of print way way too tiny of print to read the result beyond xx and yy a collaboration between montañas and the design firm pitch interactive is a complex diagram which employs a color spectrum to represent the sex spectrum a vertical axis to represent change over time and branching arrows to connect to text blocks that provide additional information Montañez hopes that visualization, with its careful adherence to terminology and inclusion of only properly categorized data, will help raise public awareness about intersex as well as transgender and non-binary people, and help align policies more closely with scientific reality, and by extension, social justice. In other words, Montañez made what was already counted count. Even when working with binary gender data, designers can still make those limited categories count. For example, in March 2018, when the reporters on the lifestyle desk of The Telegraph, a British newspaper, were considering how to honor International Women's Day, they were struck by the significant gender gap in the UK in terms of education, politics, business, and culture. They didn't have the time or the expertise to collect their own data, and even if they had, pause. There's no telling as to whether they would have collected non-binary gender data but they wanted to ensure that they didn't further reinforce any gender stereotypes. They paid particular attention to color, with the awareness that even as many designers are moving away from using pink for girls and blue for boys, most still adhere to the logic that associates warm colors with women and girls, and cool colors with men and boys. Because the stereotype that women are warmer and more caring, while men are cooler and more aloof, is still firmly entrenched in many cultures, the associated colors are easier to interpret, or so this argument goes. This stereotype is, of course, another hierarchy, and the goal of the Telegraph team was to mitigate inequality, not reinforce it, and so they took a different source for inspiration, the Votes for Women campaign of early 20th century England, in which purple was employed to represent freedom and dignity, and green to represent hope. When thinking about which of these colors to assign to each gender, they took a design principle as their guide. Against white, purple registers with far greater contrast and so should attract more attention when putting alongside the green, not by much, but just enough to tip the scales. In a lot of the visualizations men largely outnumber women, so it was a fairly simple method of bringing them back into focus, Fraser Lyness, the Telegraph's director of graphic journalism told Lisa Charlotte Rost, herself a visualization designer who interviewed Lyness for her blog. Here, one hierarchy, the hierarchy in which colors are perceived by the eye, was employed to challenge another one, the hierarchy of gender. Lyness was right. It was a fairly simple method to employ. But when put into practice, it had profound results. There are all sorts of instances of designers, as well as journalists, artists, activists, and scholars, using data and design to bring issues of gender into view. P. Gabrielle Foreman and her team oh at the God, University of Delaware so are creating long. a historical dataset of women who would otherwise go uncounted, and therefore unrecognized for their work. The team's focus is on the women who attended but were not named as participants in the 19th century colored conventions, organizing meetings in which black Americans, fugitive and free, met to strategize about how to achieve educational, economic, and legal justice. Because these women often worked behind the scenes, packing the lunches and watching the children so that their husbands could attend, running the boarding houses where out-of-town delegates stayed during the conventions, 
or even, as research has shown, standing in the back of the meeting hall in order to make their presence known, their contributions were not considered as participation in the events. But as continues to be true today think back to the issue of maternal mortality mentioned at the beginning of this chapter, or to the issue of sexual assault, as we discuss more in the numbers, don't speak for themselves. The systems of power that place women below men in patriarchal societies such as ours are the same that ensure that the types of contributions that women make to those societies are valued less, and therefore less likely to be counted. But counting is not always an unmitigated good. Sometimes counting can have. I really hope this chapter is almost done. Uh, it's too much. Like, it's all over the place. It's too many examples. Is this a data visualization chapter? Is this about like how we measure things? Is it a philosophical question about biases entering? There's so much, so much in this chapter. And it's... Mm. Unintended consequences, really bad ones, especially for marginalized groups. Some transgender people, for example, prefer not to disclose the sex they were assigned at birth, keeping their identity as a trans person private. Even for those who generally choose to make their trans identity public, being visibly identified as trans on a map, or in a database, for example, could expose them to violence. Even in a big data set, there is no additional strength in numbers. Compared to cisgendered people, folks whose genders match the sex they were assigned at birth, trans people are so small a group that they are more exposed. And I, like, the, where they throw definitions in is just unfathomable to me. We've mentioned transgender people before in this chapter, I'm pretty sure, and yet they choose to define this now? Not in an earlier chapter? Why is this in the middle, of the, toward the end of chapter three? Why is its definition coming up now? I don't understand. And therefore more vulnerable. A similar paradox of exposure is evident among undocumented immigrants. Visualizing the precise locations of undocumented immigrants may, on the one hand, help make an argument for directing additional resources to a particular area, but on the other, may alert ICE officials of the locations of their homes or schools, making the threat of deportation more likely. In cases where lives are at stake, and the security of the data can't be guaranteed, not collecting statistical outliers can be the best way to go, as Catherine has argued in some of her other work. In other cases, however, the decision to exclude outliers can be viewed as demographic malpractice, since it completely erases the record of those whose experiences are already marginalized in their everyday lives, and forecloses any future analysis for good or ill. Is there any way out of this paradox? Feminist geographer Joni Seeger has studied this issue for decades, and in 2004, experienced its effects firsthand when she began what she thought would be an easy project, making a map of female doctors for her monumental altus of women in the world. But she hit a wall when she discovered that the World Health Organization data on medical professionals did not include a field for gender. Seeker had to abandon the map, and as a result, she could not include any information about female doctors in her atlas. Ever since, her approach has been to always collect gender data according to the most precise possible categories, and also to always ask before the analysis phase whether the data should be aggregated or otherwise anonymized in order to mask any potential adverse effects. Seeker's research is focused on the collection practices associated with global and nationwide data, where she has found that gender data is often collected but rarely made available or analyzed in disaggregated form. For example, in 2015, the Pew Research Center published a report about cell phone use in Africa. Cell phone ownership surges in Africa was the title of the report, and the first chart showed the growth in cell phone ownership in the United States compared with several African countries. But buried in the text of report was a surprising finding, men are more likely than women to own a cell phone in six of the seven countries surveyed. Now, this would seem like an important distinction and perhaps one tied to other inequities, but because gender was not treated as a primary category of analysis, those who didn't read the fine print might not come away with one of its most important findings. In the case of the cell phone study, it wasn't a question of what got counted that turned out to matter, but... I am just dying with all of these examples. I'm overwhelmed. I don't know, like, I have some things that I'm taking away, but honestly, I'm already starting to, like, the first part of the chapter is starting to fade. How that counting was put to use. Sometimes, however, <sighs> questions about counting shouldn't be answered by the survey designer, 
or by the data analyst, or even by the most careful reader of this book. As a final example helps to show, questions about counting often go hand in hand with questions of consent. Flash back to another era, 2006, when another, another debate example. about a border wall was underway. Its source was the Secure Fence Act, a bill signed into law by then-President George W. Bush, which authorized the construction of 700-mile fence along the U.S.-Mexico border. But for the fence to be completed, it would have to pass through the Tejano O'odham Nation, which straddles both countries. Recognizing that they would have to build around several sacred burial sites, the U.S. government requested that the O'odham Nation provide them with the locations of those remains. In Awadam tradition, however, the locations of burial sites constitute sacred knowledge and cannot be shared with outsiders under any circumstances. The Awadam nation refused to violate its own laws by divulging information about its burial sites to the U.S. government, but it could not oppose the legal or political power of the United States. The United States built the fence, unearthing many Awadam remains in the process, and the tribe spent months attempting to get. the U.S., to return them. But why should it be assumed that the Oatam nation, which has existed for thousands of years, weigh its own laws less heavily than those of the United States, which, after all, has existed for less than 250? Who has the right to demand that information be made public, and who has the right to protect it? And what are the cultural assumptions, and not just the logistical considerations, that go along with making knowledge visible and information known? We've all heard the phrase, knowledge is power, and the example of the border wall shows how this is undeniably true. But the range of examples in this chapter, we hope, also help to show how knowledge can be used to contest power and to begin transform it. Eh? I'm, I'm so overwhelmed by examples that I'm not entirely sure, uh, like what they mean about contesting power and transforming it. Like there's no overall arching kind of like synthesis is it putting up anonymous blogs like i get the most recent example right but ugh, i'm overwhelmed my brain is overwhelmed i didn't even like have a big intro into this video and it's already over an hour and i paused and i've talked a bit but honestly this chapter is way too long it's way too dense it's covered it's it has too many examples and I don't know what the main things I'm supposed to take away is. It's really frustrating because there's a lot of good ideas in here, but they're just scattered and buried. And there's no overarching theme that is being repeated over and over or built upon from section to section that allows us to come to a conclusion. Uh, here is the problem and here is why it's a problem and here are solutions. And using the anecdotes to build on that and I just feel like they get so caught up in the anecdotes, they kind of lose the overall structure of what we're trying to get at here. By paying attention to the politics of data collection and to the systems of power that influence how that data is collected, we can work to rebalance some of the relationships that would otherwise contribute to their force. We might look to large institutions like the National Library of New Zealand, which began the Inga Yupoko Takutuka Rio Maori Working Group to develop new subject headings for the Maori materials in its collections, ensuring that those materials would be classified in terms of subjects that make sense within a Maori worldview. We might look to small research groups like Mobilized Humanities, which aggregated and visualized dozens of public data sets relating to the U.S.'s zero-tolerance policy in order to call attention to the humanitarian crisis that unfolded along the U.S. Mexico border in summer 2018. We might look to individual artists like Caroline Sinders, who is developing a data set of intersectional feminist content that can be used to train the next generation of feminist AI. Or we might look to distributed movements like hashtag Say Her Name, which employed that Twitter hashtag to create a digital record of the police violence against black women that would otherwise go unrecorded. These are each projects that recognized that what gets counted counts, and how the act of counting, and how we decide to show our results, profoundly influences the ideas we're able to take away. An intersectional feminist approach to counting, like the one we've demonstrated here, insists that you always ask questions about the categories that structure your data, and the systems of power that might, in turn, have structured them. Please be done. Please be done. Please be done. Oh! <sighs> Wow. Um, yeah, again, 
I oh I I get so frustrated by this book and I've said it so many times I don't need if I need to say it again but that little end where they just go over a a, like a a rapid list of solutions in the last paragraph that they squeeze in after they just dumped us with all the other information in the preceding part of the chapter I'm mentally exhausted I don't I I I I, I know this stuff. And I'm exhausted. Maybe it's just because it's a Saturday and it's morning and I've only had one cup of coffee, but I just feel like a lot more focused thought structuring the chapter so that the takeaways from this could be identified. Also, like, I think you only needed one discussion of data visualization. I think they had three. They had the Tumblr, they had the WordPress, and they had a detailed, they had a longer explanation of like picking out colors for a, a graph in the in a British newspaper than they did to the solutions in this last chat. Like what this word count doesn't seem to be officially allotted uh, in, in, efficiently allotted in my opinion. And honestly, I'm going to end this video cuz it already I I can't believe it's gone over an hour. Um and I don't want to add to the length of it. So, maybe you disagree. Maybe you love this chapter. Maybe you thought it was brilliant. Um, if so, you can go ahead and leave comments in the um, comment section. That's where you leave them. Otherwise, I'm going to try to get the will to go on with chapter four, because honestly, chapter three took a lot out of me, and I was hoping to do like three chapters today, but I might need to take a break. So I might come back later with new clothing. Who knows? I might come back looking exactly like this if I decide to keep going and get some breakfast see if I can get some more energy and the will to live. Um, and the next time we will be looking at unicorns, janitors, ninjas, wizards, and rock stars. Chapter four in Data Feminism. Till then, I've been Christy. You've been awesome. Thank you for your time and attention and have a great day wherever it is and whenever it is that you are.